Hey everyone, welcome to the Earthrise podcast. This is Derek Barris. What if you found out that you're only alive today because of the Holocaust? Discovering whether or not you're of Genghis Khan's stock is now a pastime. But what if that means many great-grandmothers ago your forebear was raped? How about this one? What if your death today would result in the emergence of a world savior a century from now? Future generations would claim the sacrifice to be worthwhile. Would you? These are the sorts of questions we generally don't lie around contemplating, and it's certainly not the way many books begin. Then again, it's hard to expect anything less from Dan Carlin. The host of the podcast that has made history bluffs of us all, Hardcore History, as well as the temporarily suspended common sense, Carlin has made a living out of asking us to consider uncomfortable questions. It has the miraculous effect of forcing you to consider where we are today, and hopefully to help us make better decisions in the future. That isn't speculation, but an inherent part of our biology. The human brain's hippocampus and entorhinal cortex, regions that process and store memories and perceive time, form the same network that predicts the future. We envision, we create, what's ahead by our perception of our history. In a sense, the future is our memories playing out in real time. And yet, we also have the capability of learning from the past and changing. Therein lies one of the driving arguments of Dan's podcasts and his first book. You can never know what will happen until we get there. It's a fascinating realm of possibilities to contemplate. During our talk, I chat with Dan about his nonfiction debut, The End is Always Near, Apocalyptic Moments from the Bronze Age Collapse to Nuclear Near Misses. The book is as engaging as his four-hour podcasts that dive into the depths of the human condition by investigating who we've been. Societies have collapsed before. The apocalypse has long been predicted. The reality we will live is the one we're setting the stage for now. For the last 70 years, we've, the collective we, humanity, have controlled the urge to drop nuclear bombs. Can that oversight truly last? It's always hard breaking into a new medium. I must say, this veteran broadcast journalist did a fine job. There's something funny that happens when you hear someone speak for so many hours. You imagine what it would be like talking to them. I never imagined getting the opportunity to talk with Dan, and I was certainly nervous. I've conducted over a thousand interviews in my quarter century of journalism, and sometimes your perception of who someone would be if you meet and who they actually are is way off base. But not so with Dan Carlin. I was hoping to have a great conversation with a passionate human being, and that's exactly what I got. And for that, I'm quite grateful. I hope you enjoy this conversation. You can find me at DerekBarris.com. All of my social media links and everything else is linked from there. I remember 21 years ago interviewing another Carlin named George Carlin. Even now, three, four decades after growing up loving him, his voice is still in my head when I hear certain social or political ideas uh, put across. And usually when I read books, it's my voice in my head. But as I was reading The End is Always Near, I've listened to your voice so much over the years that... I kept hearing your voice in my head, and I'm like, I'm wondering what what is it about the Carlins that <laughs> that has that ability to affect someone's consciousness like that? Well, you know, I'm not related, right? Oh no, I know. Okay, that. I know that. <laughs> we, I actually, and not only do I get that, but there's a there's a guy who does music scores for movies whose name is Dan Carlin. And when I lived in L.A., I used to get um, uh, answering machine messages from people who were asking if they could use his music in their weddings and stuff. So. Um, uh, I don't know. Uh, I always thought that there's a, you know, uh, I, I'm not super Irish like George Carlin was. I'm just kind of Irish. But my grandfather was an Irishman and uh, I'm from the United States. But but he had that story. You know, when he died, I remember they eulogized a lot of the storytelling qualities that were just naturally part of his um, his approach. And there's something about the way 
Uh, and listen, they, the storytellers are in every society on the planet and always have been. And it's people who can speak and who can carry a sort of um, a narrative without thinking about it. I mean, you can train people, the Dale Carnegie classes and all that. But I mean, in general, I think when you said George Carlin or when I think of my grandfather, it's just somebody who's really they could tell a yarn over a beer at the pub and you'd sit there and wait till the next beer till it finished. So, I mean, I, if, if I have anything, I just think it's. It's that storyteller gene, and I think it's pretty common. And in my family, we always attributed it to my grandfather. So George Carlin had a lot more Irish in him. Well, you do. You are a storyteller, and now you've decided to work in this medium of writing a book. And I know you had mentioned that people have been asking for it for a long time, but what made you decide to finally write a book? You know, it's weird, and I look at all these things as learning experiences, but it is weird having 30 years broadcast experience. And whatever you want to say about me, I'm a veteran, right? I mean, at least I've done it for 30 years. But writing the book, you get to revert back to being an absolute neophyte again, and you have to rely on the opinions and expertise of others, and you ask a lot of questions. The book always seemed like something, and it proved to be, so I mean, I was right about this, that was just going to be so time-consuming, I didn't know how I was going to fit that in my normal schedule. So we put we put off writing it for a long time. And then eventually, I fell for the, the swan song of people saying, listen, we can arrange it so that it's possible with your schedule, which is why we did it now rather than five years ago or something. So it's been something that's been uh, tempting for a long time. And this was the time where I kind of said, OK, you know what? I would ruled out some other projects. I had a little time on the schedule. I thought, why not? You know, take the leap of faith. And that's what we did. One thing you do often and you're doing it now, and it's very rare, I think, especially in an American culture, is you say we instead of I. Hmm. Is that a conscious choice? I mean, I love it because you have a team and you have people around you. But why do you know? Do you think about that? Why you say we? I think it sounds less, less self-aggrandizing. I, I feel, uh, and I can't speak for anybody else, but I feel like uh, everything that I, I'm talking, the reason you're talking to me is is a group project sort of, and I don't mean the podcast, which actually has almost nobody involved besides me on the creative side. I just mean life, you know, and, and, and I always look at people, you know, I was talking about it with somebody the other day and we were just talking about that old line about it's not the hand you're dealt, but how you play it in life. But the hand you're dealt can be very different, right? If you have bad parents, that's a bad hand from the get-go. And I've been fortunate enough to get dealt pretty good hands in most of those key areas. I had to overcome things like everyone does. But I do feel a little like, uh, you know, when I look at the the way the cards are um, here, that saying I, 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 I all the time just seems a little disingenuous and dishonest to me. I didn't know I did it. It wasn't a conscious thing, but but I can certainly, I, I'm uncomfortable with the I, 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 so I'm not surprised that I do it. Does that answer the question? Absolutely. And okay. again, it's actually something I've noticed from common sense. You've done it and it's something I appreciate. So I didn't know if it was a conscious decision or not. And it's, it's, uh, I don't want to, you know, make you think too much about it, but it is something that I've noticed. And I'm really going to notice it now. Now you've, now you've made me aware that I'm going to go start <laughs> listening for it. <laughs> so you have this book and just last night, my, my wife is uh, an adult ballet dancer. She dances for fun, but she wants That's to start. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. She's, you know, she really found her groove after taking, she fell for the myth that you have to stop dancing at 21. And she did. And then she found it a couple years ago again. She's like, why did I stop? And so we talk a lot. I, I also am a fitness instructor besides the work in media. So I, you know, we're very physical. And uh, she was like, I've written a number of books. And she's like, where do you start? And I said, well, you, you just start and then you iterate and you, you figure things out because she was referencing a new book that I'm writing. And with your book, it's there's so much in here. But where did you start? Why did you decide to focus on what you did? Well, I think a large part of it was determined by the parameters at the outset, the stuff we just alluded to, which is the schedule, right? I wasn't giving up the podcast. And I, as I always tell people, it's not like we have a lot of slack time when we're not working on the podcast because we don't get a lot out. So we're always working on it. It's like the assembly line's running at full tilt. So then when somebody says, hey, want to do something else in addition to that, you always try to figure out where the in addition to that part's going to come from. And, and on this book, it constrained it a lot because I wasn't going to take a year off and just say, you know, what do I really want to – it was going to be, OK, what can we make work that the audience will enjoy? Because like I said, not only have they been asking for 
a print version so that people who don't listen to podcasts could have it. But they were asking for multiple languages, which is really difficult because uh, listeners will always offer, and I know this seems far afield from your question, but listeners will always offer to do the translation for me. But as I always try to tell them, well, one, we have no way to check your translation. Two, a lot of this stuff is really, you know, I, I use words sometimes very specifically to allow me to explore issues that if you're not careful with the wording can get you into trouble. So I didn't want to uh, rely on some some translator of Mongolian to get that specifically right. And so we always sort of begged off there and the book provided an opportunity to fill some of those long standing requests and needs because they'll do the translating. It's all going to be taken care of. So this filled a need that the audience was asking for uh, in terms of why write the book or, or I mean, what was the original question in terms of specificity? Well, the exact I mean, starting with the Bronze Age and then moving up. Yeah, why would we do it that way? Yeah. So the editors, like I said at the beginning, I was a neophyte. They were going to teach me how to do this. And one of the things that they suggested was a good way to start was to lay out all your past work sort of on the big playroom floor where you had space and try to find commonalities between it because obviously I have a lot of material that never made it into a lot of the shows and, and, and whatnot. And it was funny. It was kind of like the old inkblot test uh, the, from, the, from the psychologist where I, I never go back and look at old work, to be honest. Uh, I can't stand it because I'm always looking at, you know, just give me four more months and I really could have polished that or something like that. But it was hard not to hard not to notice that the ink blots began to, to form a, a, a somewhat disturbing pattern in terms of my interests. But there's a lot of that Statue of Liberty in the sand, as I always call it, because it's become a wonderful shorthand that everyone understands the end of the planet of the apes. A lot of that sort of stuff that that gets into a lot of the questions that are fascinating to me. And, and you know, I'm not a big believer in history having patterns like some people like to say, but there are fork in the road questions that I've been fascinated with forever and that have no answers. And those sort of popped out of the old material. The basic questions may be different, but they boil down to the same either or situation. Either things are going to be the way they always have been or they're not. Example, either we're going to continue to have another major all-out total war between the great powers on the planet as we have since caveman times or whatever passes for that, or we're not. If we have another one, it's going to involve nuclear weapons and all the other fun stuff in the arsenals. So it's relatively inconceivable. But so is the idea that we've banished major war between great powers for the first time in human history. So a lot of the book boils down to that same either or. Either it's going to be the way it always has been, which is terrifying, or it's not going to be the way it always has been, which is fascinating. And so the book doesn't really answer any questions because, you know, how do you answer a question like, can humankind evolve to deal with the power of its weapon systems? There is no right answer to that, but it's hard to think of a more important potential question, if you know what I mean. Right. I've noticed an uptick recently. Actually, New Yorker did a big piece on it. I live in Los Angeles and... That's my hometown. Oh, okay, great. I'm East Coaster, but I moved here eight years ago. And there is, uh, let's just say, a lot of people interested in astrology, which is not really my my field or beliefs. Very system. Los Angeles <laughs> thing, yeah. But there's this, there's always this sense. One of one of the um, sayings is, uh, you know, that it was meant to be, or or things of that nature. And I always wonder when I hear someone say that that if they have any actual understanding of either evolutionary biology or history. Because if they actually studied those things, they would understand that, uh, you know, it, it is what it is and how you deal with it is really what's relevant. And in the book, you bring up uh, in the beginning psychohistory, which I wouldn't put in the same category as, say, homeopathy, which I do consider a pseudoscience. But you, you mentioned that some academics considered a pseudoscience. Why do you think that is? Uh, because scientific rigor is difficult to apply in certain types of situations. So that's one of the things I argue about human history, too. It's a lot more scientific than it was when I was growing up, and that's a good thing, right? You have radiocarbon dating, you have peer-reviewed studies, all those kinds of things. So you have, you have more factual history than you've ever had before. But there are some, and I think you noticed this in the book, there are some elements of human, the part in, you know, right, that precedes the word history, um, that are not quantifiable. One of, one of the things that's not quantifiable, for example, um, is that toughness question, right? The individual human elements that we all take for granted on the small scale, 
but that seem very difficult to figure out what their importance is on the mass scale. So the psychohistory is a perfect example. You, you would not find it controversial at all. In fact, it would be controversial if somebody said that child rearing practices have no bearing on the future adult that you get at the end of the process, right? It would be stupid. On the other hand, if, I, I mean, how, how do you then expand that out to the mass level? So let's just imagine, you know, to, to, to make a, a ridiculous argument, except that it might have been true in a lot of history. Let's imagine that one of the worst child abuse cases that you've ever heard of is the, is the functional norm for most people. How would that translate into a different world? Well, there's no way you have no way to figure that out. You can't even begin to play with it unless you're going to start talking about some Netflix series based on some fantasy. At the same time, it almost seems like common sense, doesn't it? If abused children turn out somewhat scarred, what if everybody's an abused child? Can you explain? Does a scarred society evolve from that? Again, it's 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 an either or question. Either it is or it isn't. And both of those answers are fascinating. So the psychohistory thing. I have a little sympathy for the people in that field because they've chosen a field that may or may not be really important, but how would you ever study it? How would you ever prove it, right? It's based on speculation, even if the speculation is a little like that toughness question. It seems to make sense to us. If I if I start you know, going Socratic with you in, in a line of questioning, I think I can get you to the point where you can say, oh yeah, this is very important. So then we talk about, well, okay, if, if, if everybody in society is more or less that way, is it important for society? And you can begin to have this this discussion about things that we can't quantify, that would be difficult to study, but that are fascinating. And I've always considered, you know, when people say, if you're not a historian, what is it you're doing? And I always say, I'm playing in this realm that 100 years ago, historians, you know, because the standards were so different, that, that they would have felt comfortable playing around in, right? This is the mud of of the of the story that I roll around in. And this psycho history thing is, is just another one of those fascinating questions. Like I said, I feel for the guy because I think Lloyd DeMoss probably put his entire life into this. And yet because of the nature of this thing he's put his entire life into, he's never going to see maybe the satisfaction or respect that, you know, somebody working in a more quantifiable field might get. It was interesting that right after I finished your book, I read uh, Edward O. Wilson's uh, The Origins of Creativity. And he actually asks a very similar question, the same question that you do in the beginning. You go into more depth in it, though. He, it's kind of a passing thing with him. But when you write, how much would it affect your feelings about a murderous event from history if you found out that you were alive today only because of it? Close in the book, you also write, as my dad used to say, don't get cocky. Yeah. And I, I wonder what you feel about the role of humility in understanding both history and our current situation where we are today, planetarily with nuclear power, climate change and all of those things. Well, you know, I have to admit to being uh, involved right now as we speak in a sort of um, reevaluation process, maybe of some of my core beliefs based on. Uh, I, I would say in part on what you just pointed out, humanity's capacity to do things like run themselves, for example. Uh, I've always been what I referred to, uh, for lack of a better term, as sort of a Jeffersonian agrarian supporter of democracy. But this sort of implies that people can take care of themselves. Taking care of themselves and running, you know, playing the part of an informed citizenry, I guess is the way, is the proper term to use. Uh, and, and I'm having second thoughts about that because I notice in the body politic, for lack of a better phrase, exactly the deficiencies you just mentioned. I mean, if we can't have some level of wisdom or empathy, that's going to make us bad rulers, even if the only thing we're running is our own lives. Um, I also feel like, I mean, you can see it with science, right? I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm the first person to say that nobody should take anything as as automatic truth, that we should question authority, we should question experts, that that's just smart. At the same time, it's just dumb to not listen to them at all, right? In other words, why have science if you're not going to listen to it? Now, can science be misused or can it be uh, can it be taken to support causes that an authoritarian government wants? I mean, in other words, is the misuse of science or the potential misuse of science a real thing? Of course it is. But we have to be able to walk this fine line between, yes, we want to avoid the misuse of science and we want to be suspicious and we want to be careful, but we also want to follow the people that have spent so much time studying this stuff because otherwise we're relying on our own evidence, which is 
Well, look at our own lives. So many people can hardly run their own lives. Um, and I'm trying to figure out how much of this is a facet of our modern world versus how much of it's always been around. So for example, uh, let's just say, I don't like IQ numbers. I don't think IQ tests show intelligence, but, but for the sake of argument, let's play with it. Uh, let's say, what's the average IQ? 100, it's supposed to be 100, something like that. So let's play that that's the average IQ amongst any cross subset of people you choose and that it always has been. Uh, maybe in a less complicated world, enough people are over the functionality line, for lack of a better word, and can run their own lives. You know, if we live in agrarian 18th century America, maybe 100 IQ gets, you, gets most people into the informed citizenry category. As the world becomes more complex, as it becomes harder to pick out fake news from real news, as the science gets more complex, as the stimuli become greater – do you have to have a 125 IQ to play that same role now? And if you do, how does that impact a democracy based on an informed citizenry if that goalpost is moving? If, on the other hand, it has always been that way, and there's always been a, a, the, the current level of people that I would not consider able to play the role of informed citizenry, well, then, then you get back to some of the questions from a couple hundred years ago or all the way back to ancient Greek and Roman writers asking whether or not you know, we're all capable of voting. And that takes me into uncomfortable territory that, that, that I can't process right now. So in answer to your question, it's, it's something I'm actually thinking about a lot. And, and it's, it's foundational. And I haven't come up with the answers yet. But that gives you an insight into the kind of things I'm trying to weigh. I know that's a really bad answer, especially <laughs> to, to try to convert that into writing. <laughs> well, no, I mean, we're always working things out. And I, I much more appreciate the process than any definitives that may or may not be true. That's all I can give you. Yeah. Derek, <laughs> I specialize in the process, and not the answers. <laughs> well, actually, I'm only qualified to talk about process. <laughs> one process that I noticed earlier today on Facebook, which I still go on all the time to talk to people, but sometimes I just get so frustrated by it. But someone, there was some meme that was about the contribution of white men throughout history isn't actually that important because it was only going to feed other white men and they brought up British authors and everything. And I just wonder, not bringing this out to race at all, but in terms of studying history, how do you feel about in the last few years looking at everything historically and trying to just basically wipe it off the record because we don't like, because today, who we are today, we don't like what has happened in the past. This is going to be a controversial answer, but I, I look at that as a form of racism too, only because if you, if you drop the race pretense for a minute and you look at this as human history and all of us in this together, those contributions by those British writers are contributions for people of every color, just like the things that the Chinese invented are inventions for all human beings. If you actually stop seeing it through the prism of race, then we can all take credit for those kinds of achievements, just like we can all take the blame for the terrible things we do to each other as well. I mean, slavery is a perfect example. So the iteration that we all remember, because it's the nearest one to us, is, is the white on black slavery. But slavery is a human condition. Going back to the very beginning. And everybody enslaves everybody if you go back far enough in time because we love the idea. I, I once called it in tongue in cheek the original labor saving device, human bondage. I try not to look at the world divided into either a white supremacy category or a white non supremacy category. If we look at this like we're all in it together, then we share all the credit and we share all the blame. And that's kind of how I see it because look, I always try to tell, you know, when you'll talk to a racist online, or what did what, white people built everything, you turn around and say, wait a minute, it's right place, right time. I mean, this is the sort of stuff Jared Diamond wrote about, too. Right place, right time, right conditions, interacting with the other societies, building off of them. I mean, it gets so silly to a point that you just want to, I don't know, it's, it's, you, 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 not enough people taking maybe remedial courses. But to me, I look at humanity as either, you know, I mean, we're all, I said, maybe we're all in it together is the best way to do it. And, and just so you know, I take all the credit for all the Chinese and African and South American discoveries too. As a white guy, it's not just my own, I take it all, it's all mine. But you see what I'm saying is that, is that you're almost looking at it through a racial lens to decry those, you know, there was, um, one of the great things that, that modern history does so much better than it did when I was a kid is understand that things didn't start with Greece, right? That, they're, that the Greeks themselves, you know, the so-called cradle of Western civilization, 
that there was a world before the Greeks and the Greeks knew of it, right? They were influenced by it. They read books by it. They, they had people in the, in the halls of education in these other societies, Egypt, Persia, those places, and, and, and through Persia, maybe even China and whatnot. So there was never this separation where people were developing, you know, in, in these, in these isolated little bubbles. So, so even the Greeks, the founders of Western civilization were taking stuff from earlier eras too. We are all like blended wine and we've all been on this. I mean, look, and the wheel to, to take an old medieval metaphor about the wheel of fortune that, you know, sometimes you're down and sometimes you're up. Hegel, who was one of the few historians, philosopher historians, George, Friedrich William Hegel. That's that's been almost too difficult for me to read or understand. Uh, so so take this with a grain of salt, right? My C minus Hegel uh, analysis. <laughs> but but Hegel had this idea that that in certain times in certain places, certain peoples, empires, or groups are up, and then the the world spirit, as I think he calls it, moves from place to place. And and so to take a tiny little snapshot and say, yeah, we white people are great because of everything since what. The 1600s on, right? The last couple hundred years, it's like a hot stock, civilizationally <laughs> speaking, right? I mean, so I, I don't, my problem is I don't even look at it that way. To me, the achievements of the guys from the, the, the British and American and French Enlightenment are the achievements of people from Africa and South America and everything else too. And, and, and they can share in it just like they can share in the blame for how we treat peoples that we have more power over and can abuse and exploit. It's kind of how we do business as human beings and no one's got a monopoly and no race has a monopoly on that behavior good and bad all right i'm looking at a book right now one of the most influential classes i took i went to Rutgers in the 90s and there was a professor named ivan van sertima who wrote a book called they came before columbus yeah and, was, and yeah. he posited the idea that the malians were in mexico long before cortez mm. in that book but i remember reading in the beginning of the book about the malian king and how many other malians were enslaved under his power right it's not to apologize or make any reference it's just to point out that that is what humans do when they attack power regardless of where you're from and it's it's I just find it's becoming very hard to have nuanced conversations when you're talking about the historical record if you just want to point out what has happened because I don't see how you can make things better if you don't discuss what actually happened on their own grounds well it, look do, do it um you know we, I was always very fond of like these mental exercises so when I go back to things like the ancient Greeks I love the way that they used to have exercises with so many of the you know it's like an algebraic equation with nothing for x and y and they have to argue their way around to figure out what x and y is without data and and I feel the same way about the race thing so take the race question out of the history thing a minute imagine that we're all the same color okay for a minute and then always and that we always have been now relook at all those things we were just talking about. How does it change it, right? So that's what I meant when I said that it almost looks like racism to notice, you know, that these white guys discovered this stuff and you used it to oppress other people. First of all, why give them all the credit? Second of all, why make them take all the blame? I mean, it, it just seems to me to be a wonderful way. It's almost like um, looking back on history and doing the same sort of shaming that we do online today. And, and you know, another thing that drives me crazy about it is that at least today, everybody kind of has an idea, you know, what you're going to say that's going to get you in trouble. Those people had no idea what the current standards were going to be for their past behavior. So they could not have complied even if they wanted to. So, I mean, for example, if in the future, if a hundred years from now, eating meat or driving cars gets your statue pulled down in the public square, how on earth could somebody have known that and, and, and altered their behavior accordingly? I feel the same way about the people in the past. They're operating in their world trying to be good people or successful people or at least uh, attain their dreams through the standards of that day as they understood it. What else could they do? And I feel the same way about us today. I, I think it is almost taking the lens at which we are we are examining modern society, which is obviously getting a lot of attention and is in the news right now and that people are talking about, and applying it to earlier eras as well, where it even seems more out of place, if you will. At least, you know, if you want to talk about attaining a higher level of standards amongst us all now based on shared opinions of what's okay to express and not express, and be, that's one thing. But to then go superimpose it on a bunch of people who have no say and couldn't have known about it, well, that just seems extreme, no matter what. You write about how the further you go into history and prehistory, there are too few sources to pull from. So we're really, there's a bit of educated guesswork that happens. And I wonder 
in 100 years or 200 years. Will historians have the same problem in the sense that right now there are too many sources to look at? No, let me, let, let me compare it. I got a great comparison. It's not the first time I've used it, but that's how good of a comparison it is. So I started in the news business in Los Angeles and I worked on the assignment desk. And so you'd, you'd show up in the morning and there would be a file of all the potential things you could cover that day. And the file was enormous, right? Because it's Los Angeles. And so my job was to go through the file and go, no, no, not good enough. We're not covering this. No, right? So then I get a job as a reporter in Western Oregon and you open up the file for what to cover that day and there's two pieces of paper in it and nothing else. So your job is totally different than it was in Los Angeles. It's the same way with historians, right? So the job of somebody discovered trying to work with ancient Egypt is there are two things in your assignment desk planning folder and you have to go from there. The problem future historians are going to have is there's going to be 10 bazillion things and you're going to have to try to figure out what matters and why. So it's 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 a needle in a haystack problem and in the old days there's one haystack and one needle, today there's a million haystacks and a million needles. And so the problem of the historian is going to be much more about filtering rather than finding nuggets upon which to hang data points if that makes sense. Is there a precedent before of not knowing which sources to trust? Oh, yeah. no, that's the nature of the that's historiography. I mean, that's that's upper division history right there. That's the whole thing. The sources, how, how trustworthy they are. How, I mean, I'll give you an example. So I got one of the perks of my gig is that you get some fun tours, right? You get some backstage things. So I spoke at, at a place called the Westminster School once, which is attached to Westminster Abbey in London. It's one of the oldest schools in, in, in Britain. And they they didn't pay me. So my payment was I got to get the fa the special backstage tour of Westminster Abbey. So they took me up behind the place, up to the medieval floors, way where nobody gets to go. And they pulled out a bunch of things and showed me. And one of the things was a seal, you know, from like the 13th century. And they were talking to me about this seal. And then they, they dropped the, the information, though, that the seal's a phony. It's a fake. And they said, but it's a fake from only about 50 years later. So for the longest time, modern historians thought the fake was real because it's also hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old. <laughs> the point the point being, though, that the job of the historiographer is to figure out what sources you can trust and not only what sources you can trust, but what sources you can trust on what. So some are good for some things, but you can't trust them on this other stuff. So in other words, the discern both the discernment over the the applicability of sources and then the choices, you know, the the cherry picking of which things you pick to include in your history. I mean, those things together are probably 75% of historiography. You've made history accessible to so many people, or it made so many people interested in it. And I wonder, bigger picture question, what do you think, and we'll take right now as an example, because we're living through history always, but what is the value of studying history? I'm going to say a few things I said the other night at a live show, because it's become sort of my standard response to that question, but it's a fantastic question. I was reading Mein Kampf recently, because I read it about once a year. It is one of the most twisted things to read, and then realize that you're coming as close to the mind of Adolf Hitler as you can come, right? Genghis Khan never wrote a book like that. The funny thing when you're reading Mein Kampf is to come across the occasional passage where you agree with him. It's very disturbing. And, and one of the passages that I agreed with Hitler, but it shows you how long these critiques have been in place, was on the value of teaching history in schools. And he was – you could almost see the spittle on the original page as he's foaming at the mouth about the, the useless time wasting of the history professors who cram these useless facts into the minds of their pupils who forget them five minutes after the test is over and what we could have used that, that valuable education time for. Well, that shows you how long the critique's been around. So then I got a, uh, an invitation once to write for Edutopia, which is George Lucas's uh, magazine about teaching. I guess it's the best way to describe it. And I declined because I said the last bunch of people I want to tell how to do their job is a bunch of people who do this for a living and are very good at it. And they wrote me back and they said, no, no, no. The problem is, is we always have that. That's the only kind of people we get. And we're looking for some people to spark some outside the box thinking. So they had me write a piece on teaching history and, and how we might do it differently, not better. I wouldn't do better, but differently. And I said, listen, I, I actually agreed with Hitler and said that any argument you make 
for why it's important, for example, to know that Columbus discovered, in air quotes, America in 1492 goes out the window if the people don't remember the fact, right? If it's gone five minutes after the test, then if you say an informed citizenry should know this, they still don't know it. So I went in a different direction and said, that's not the part of history that's applicable to other things. In other words, if that doesn't come up on some test somewhere, you don't need that info. But the reason you need to know history is because it teaches you how the historical process works. And I said in that Edutopia article that it doesn't matter what you're learning history about if you if you begin to understand how something goes from A to Z. So I said, everyone is history enthusiast based, and that's because history is everything. There's a history of dentistry, a history of sports, a history of motorcycles, a history of fashion. So you find what the student is interested in, and then you have them study the history of that. For example, you show them a motorcycle, one of the first ones ever built, and then you show them one of the 2019 ones in the showroom, and you have them trace the development of how you got from the original to this. And that begins to show you how history and things and events and changes unfold over time. And that is a skill like arithmetic and math and, and subtraction that you can use in your everyday life, whereas that advanced trigonometry may never come up. And so that was so to answer your question, what value is history? The names and dates thing, if you remember it, well, then I think it does help you become an informed citizen more generally. But at the same time, I don't think most people get much out of that. And I think they get a lot more if you could just basically have them understand how things turn into other things and unfold and develop and evolve over time because that's really the historical process. So in answer to your question, to me, understanding that is invaluable. And, and so that's what I would say is really what's value. Because, you know, like a history professor of mine once said, life is like a soap opera on television. And unless you go rewatch the earlier episodes, you don't know why this person's mad at this other person or why they're sleeping with them or why they don't like it. You know what I'm saying? And you don't know any of the characters or where they come from or their background. So history fills in the gaps on that, whether it's motorcycles, fashion, sports or whatever. You mentioned that you don't think that patterns necessarily repeat themselves. But one thing that I did notice after the 2016 election is how many people I'm connected with, both in life and social media, that all of a sudden were politically active, who would you used to get annoyed that the fact that I'd always post political things and they finally realized that, hey, something's happening here and now it's affecting me. And I thought that was going to be a big boost to talking about civics. And then the next year in the LA in the mayoral election that put Garcetti in, only 13% of Los Angeles turned out to vote. And so it made me question, I'm like, are we really engaging in civics? So I want to ask the same question that I just did with history is what do you think the value of understanding civics is and how we can do it better? Well, first, let me clarify my earlier statement, because I guess it depends on how you want to classify the word patterns, because you can overlay patterns on anything. So uh, human beings, when we get into large groups, reliably behave certain ways. Individual variables are endless and impossible to put your finger on. But when we get together in large groups, I think we devolve toward the mean a little bit and so become more predictable. I don't know if that's a pattern or not, but it fits if it's the way you used it in your question, how can I ask a personal question, Derek? How old are you? I'm 44. Okay. The exact thing that you just mentioned was part of my uh, awakening politically. So when I was younger, you know, and, and it was a different United States too, so maybe that was more. But Democrat and Republican and that kind of thing seemed to make some sense. But it's when you start to see the human tendency to only hold the other side to the same standard. You know, it, it, it's a human quality, right? So, so it's the same thing you, you see with this whole um, phenomenon. I think they call it, uh, is it whataboutism? Is that the right term for it? Whataboutism? Yes, you know, when, yes. Okay, okay. So, so that, but that's what, there was no term for it back in the day, but, but that's in large part, in my opinion, what got us to where we are now. Because by not holding both sides to the same standard, right, uh, by Democrats, you know, castigating Republicans for behavior that they would look the other way when Democrats do and vice versa. We have turned, and, and it always was, things like oversight into something that's a political event, which means if you're waiting for the non-political impeachment trials to ever happen, you're basically saying that we're not going to have any and there won't be any oversight. Give me your question again so that I make sure I answer the specific question. The, the civics, yes. Uh... Civic, 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 uh, getting in a roundabout way. 
I thought the same thing you did that when that when things got bad enough because I was out in this I was out I was a big protester back in my college days and I, I I used to think that once people wake up that that things will change and I remember thinking one of the, one of the first moments that ever happened to me was when we got a Democrat elected for the first time since I had been able to vote uh, so I lived through the Reagan years and then his vice president for four years. And I was young enough to think, OK, everything will change once we get the other party in power because it had been so long and that there was a real difference in the thing. And what happened to me was that was my great awakening, because all of a sudden when the Democratic president did the things that we've been screaming about the Republicans doing for years, people shut up and sat on their hands because they didn't want to you know, cripple their own president. Right. Because they believed in his policies. But but it was my first inkling to how flexible we could all be on our standards, depending on who was who was violating them. And you fast forward to today and, and it evolved to get back to what I was saying about the historical process into this what about ism where it doesn't matter what you say because everybody has too many examples of where the other side wasn't consistent. So our side doesn't. They're not saying, well, we'll start with us. Be No, they just, we don't have to do it because you didn't do it. And now here we are. So in terms of the civic responsibility, it, it's simply when politics intrudes upon the lives of individuals. So if you want a pattern, there's your pattern. Most people would rather not think about it. And, and that, that may be fine. But then when they do think about it, they're uninformed, they're playing catch up, and they're reading and listening to what people they respect say, but they don't really know necessarily themselves. But how could they? Most of the time, this isn't their gig, right? They're, they're in it now because somebody is intruding on their lives or intruding upon the lives of people they love. I mean, this is the same thing. Let me use the analogy I grew up with, the draft. Um, a guy said something to me once, um, and, and Nixon said it first, actually. It was Richard Nixon's belief that if the draft were ended, the war protests would go away. The Vietnam War protests would go away because most of those people weren't as high minded as they pretended to be out in the streets. They didn't want to go to Vietnam. And cynically, that's how we ended the draft in this country, by the way, and haven't had one since. It was to stop the war protests. And as cynical as it was, it did. And, and in other words, so when I was in the 80s protesting and we used to get, you know, the, the mantra at the time was that people don't care. It's not like the 60s. Nobody will get out in the streets. Well, nobody had anything that was compelling enough to make them drop what they were doing and currently enjoying and get out there. Right. We were protesting things like apartheid in South Africa. But people here didn't care that much about it because it didn't affect them. If we were talking about apartheid here, well, they might. So I, I think that, that that if you want to talk about a pattern of human behavior, the more something affects you, the more likely you're going to be to drop what you're doing and pay attention to it. And I think the current times have affected more people, if that makes sense. But I think it's naive, looking at history, to expect them to maintain this level of engagement and enthusiasm and passion once – I mean that's why we can never get real reforms. They may get Trump out of office, but we're not going to fix – uh, the problems that having him here has exposed because that would take a level of long-term engagement that most people have shown an unwillingness to participate in. And I don't blame them for it. It seems to be like the norm. In other words, you'd be blaming people for the way they are. I think I think the majority of, of humankind doesn't give that much of a rat's ass about this stuff and only do when it gets hot enough. There are political junkies like yours truly who are going to be into it no matter what. And there's going to be these people whose money and livelihood, like lobbyists and politicians and all the people in D.C. that rely on it and the, the people that have to get up every morning and scream politics into the radio, <laughs> they're going to care about it. But the average Joes and Janes have you know, they got to figure out how to put food on the table, take care of their sick kids and all those kind of things. Politics is a luxury for them. Well, the analogy I think of and use often is growing up during Reagan era in the 80s was all the playgrounds. There were there was metal and just spikes everywhere. And, you know, there was an element of danger of being on the playground. And now it's all plastic and it's on mats and it's safe. And what are some of the dangers of that lack of engagement? Where do you do you foresee What's going on now? Any real dangers of turning into an autocracy or dictatorship or something of that nature here? Yeah, once again, you're hitting at sort of the, the roots of things I've been thinking about. So I, I'm a freedom person. That's how I always describe myself. I don't like labels. But but in general, I try to balance things out and I try to include our individual freedom uh, as, as, a, as a weight on the scale, right? I feel like these days it's not even a consideration. But when you look at what most people want, most people – I think want, especially now and especially when they're being told to be afraid, they want safety and they want security. So you brought up the playgrounds a little earlier. 
I, w- I wouldn't, you know, that's often brought up as a negative, but I have two kids who are teenagers now and I, I'd be glad that the thing was safer. Right. Um, I, 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 yeah, I don't look at it as a, as a great thing that we, you know, it, it's not a badge of honor that we had to play on those playgrounds. It was, the, <laughs> you know, it was the seventies and, and the funding wasn't there or whatever, but I, I mean, and listen, to be honest, uh, parents weren't around as much. I mean, if I'm, when I was raising my kids, it was, my wife is going to say when you were raising your kids, when my wife was mostly raising my kids and I was helping, you know, we would be out on the playground in large part because we were actually afraid to leave them. Uh, we thought, it, you know, I mean, with all of the, you don't know, you don't want your kid to, they, you want to be supervised, I guess is the basic point. But when you're out there, you go, well, heck, my kid could fall down and hurt themselves on this playground. Look at those spiky things. Let's get this fixed. Whereas I got to be honest with you, uh, when I was a kid in the 70s, we left in the morning and my parents had no idea where we were. They didn't know what the playground looked like because they weren't out there with me. You know what I'm saying? In other words, some of this may actually fall to, to other variables like more parental engagement and them actually knowing more about, you know, this gets back to the Lloyd DeMoss child rearing um, thing in the book where I've heard people say that nowadays parents are raising the finest generation of children, at least by the standards we measure it, that have ever been raised. That may be great for your individual child. Does that translate into a better society? I, I, I don't know how you would even measure it, but it's fascinating to think about. So on the civic engagement question, well, like I said, this gets me back to some fundamental issues that, that lead me down rabbit holes that I'm not even comfortable traveling through. I mean, for example, one of the either or questions I've never been able to, to satisfactorily answer for my own for my own reasons is – is a highly informed voter equally as good as a voter who knows nothing at all? And it's, it's a reductio ad absurdum kind of question because, I mean, who's going to answer yes, right? At the same time, then, you begin to establish a baseline that then says, okay, so is there a minimum standard, right? Is there somebody who's too dangerous to vote? And you begin to get to these – I mean, listen – if you look at the founding fathers and the Constitution and the way things were done in the individual states when this country was founded, most people in most states could not vote. There were all sorts of reasons, uh, skin color, uh, income level, all these kinds of things that, that over time we've done away with and created a more equitable society with a larger foundational base of representation, et cetera, et cetera. Did we lose anything in the process? Do we vote better today than we did back then? These are heretical yet interesting questions. It gets back to what we were saying earlier about the the level of IQ, for lack of a better word, that might be necessary to be an informed voter. If you're not an informed voter, are you hurting society by voting? I would suggest that informed voters do not vote a certain way, that they just are the ones more easily swayed either by anyone. Uh, with the, I mean, look at the political advertising. Is that written for you? It's not written for me. It's, it's written to sway people who can be swayed by that level of argument, whether they're trying to sway them to vote for a right wing or conservative cause or a left wing or liberal cause. There's a lot of people who would love a higher level of debate. But then what happens to all those folk? And don't they have a right to help determine the future? And then you might say, yeah, but what if they're making bad decisions because they don't spend as much time reading the newspaper as I do? And then they turn around and go, why would you read the newspaper? That's all fake news. Then you say, because the planet's warming and all the scientists say so. And then the other person says, those scientists are all part of a scam. Do you see what I mean? We were already, this is why you can't have political discussions anymore. You know, I mean, it all boils down to the same thing. Fake news. And we're done. And that's why I'm not doing common sense right now, because let's put it this way. I always like to say wisdom requires a flexible mind. And I'm going through one of those mind periods where I'm examining my own beliefs and trying to trying to stomach some of them. I, I like to think that everything's on the table when I try to figure things out. But even my own cultural conditioning makes it difficult to think about certain realities. And some of them boil down to the things you're asking questions about. And I got that sense, and I I miss common sense. By the way, I was I hear that know. from a lot of people, but you know, it's like it, it's the same thing you have with the backup quarterback syndrome in football, right? I think you all miss it because you're sure it was going to be the most wonderful thing if you just heard it again. Whereas if I come in there and throw three interceptions really quickly, you're going to go, I have no idea why I missed that so much. So you're projecting, I think maybe. A little bit, but it's nice, you know, even getting to talk to you about this and really it's just processing on my end and just because of listening to you for so long. But 
I think when you have a certain belief system and you live a certain way, and I would say that I'm very much aligned with a lot of how you think and present. Whatever the and, hell that is. <laughs> <laughs> the, the hearing it back at you and just knowing, allowing you to let yourself understand that you're not crazy. That's very useful. <laughs> you know, that's almost <laughs> the exact line about 30 people have sent me in emails. <laughs> but it's true. It's true. You know what it boils down to, Derek? I, you know, I, I, it's funny. It, all that long-winded stuff really boils down to the idea, I think, of, you know, can we be smart, rational, wise people? And can we think about these things in a smart, rational, wise way? And to, to get to that choice that I said my whole book was about, either we can or we can't. And both of those outcomes are fascinating and scary. I don't, I don't have the, the slightest idea how to get to can without eliminating wide swaths of people that I believe have a stake in society and should have a say. So I'm trying to find some tightrope to walk on all this. I just can't figure it out right now. Last question, and you write that it's much safer to be alive now than it used to be, and it kind of is what we've been talking about in terms of safety and everything. And and let me. Uh, just say that I, I don't have problems with plastic playgrounds. I just think it was a good analogy for the, so <laughs> for I, the topic. I time. No worries. I, I, never, I, I never draw I, conclusions. <laughs> um, I don't have children, but I would imagine if I did, I'd want them to be safe. You know what? Can I just stop you? Because it's worth knowing. Because that was the, th the canard I couldn't stand when I was younger, was this idea that when you have kids, you'll understand. I hated that. I felt like it was exclusive. <laughs> but I have to tell you, Derek, it's true. I'm sorry to inform you that, that as, as a person who was so concerned with individual liberty, everybody would always say, well, when you have kids, you'll be in a position where you're responsible for somebody else's individual liberty, and it's different. And God damn it, they were right, and it pisses me off. But I just, it, it, it's one of those things where the, having the kids, because all of a sudden, it, it's not about just taking care of me, which is always where I sort of framed these debates. And, and it's very, you know, there's a line from The Lord of the Rings I always love. And I'm going to try to quote it correctly, but it it, it is said, go not to the elves for uh, counsel, for they will say both yay and nay. And and I always felt a little like that. And then you become a parent and that isn't an option anymore. So this live and let live freedom oriented person had to be the autocratic dictator in the house. And it forced me to consider like if you're already an autocratic dictator type, maybe you learn nothing from parenting. But for my personality type, it was um. Yeah, it was a bit of a wake up call. I'm I'm much more the dictator and the safety police with my kids than I ever was with myself. And so so there's some personal growth there, at least on my part. <laughs> but you and this kind of ties together everything, so I think it's a good place to close. But it's something I actually I write about neuroscience and science a lot for the site and think about these things. I'm writing a book on psychedelics right now and how they can potentially be used in therapy. That's been a thing for a long time, yeah. Yeah, well, it's it it's nice seeing that it's actually coming to fruition now and there are centers that are opening and people are starting to take it seriously, which is I think really important because Oh, they used to call those people the CIA. It was a <laughs> seriously. <laughs> DARPA just announced last month that they're they're launching their own program investigating psychedelics because the PTSD problem is way out of control and they don't have any they don't have a grip on it which is great but it's a you know watching going from the CIA to there like that's pretty fascinating thinking about history we went from I think it took to the middle of the 19th century to get to a billion people on the planet and then two things happened within 50 years is germ theory was discovered and vaccines be became widespread the, the theory had been around for a long time and then all of a sudden you have a hundred thousand years of development to get to a billion people and now we're at seven and a half billion people i attribute a lot of it to germ theory and vaccines those two things coming about and now we're at a place where the anti-vaxxer movement and all of these things just a general distrust of science we've been talking about politics a lot but there's also this distrust of science and authority in that and I wonder if you have any thoughts on that and how it affects us culturally. Two separate questions, I think. The first one on the on the population thing, I actually had the conversa a conversation the other night, and I'm not going to say who it is, but it, it was a super intelligent human being, one of those people that it's intimidating to even be talking to them. And I made some comments about population and all that stuff, and he said, listen, and again, I'm just – I'm going with what he said. I'm, I don't have the math to prove it. But but I was basically kind of taking your position. I, the population was an issue and all this. He said, listen, you could fit the entire planet 
in New York City. He said, he said, you're going to have, he said, he said, water's not even a problem because you can desalinate it for three to four dollars right now a gallon. Uh, and he went on this whole spiel about how this is one of those myths that we can't live the way we're living now. Because I, I had asked what I thought was this intelligent question about what the carrying, what he thought the carrying capacity of the planet is the way we do things now, right? So if we insist on changing nothing, right, uh, we're going to live exactly the way we live right now. How many people th could the planet sustain indefinitely? Is it a million? Is it 10 million? And I was hoping for some interesting answer. And he totally went off the grid and said, no, 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 it's none of those things. We don't have a population problem. He goes, it's a myth. Uh, we may have a lifestyle problem, but we don't have a population problem. Now, I don't know if I buy that. But this guy is not any of those things that we would associate with anti-science conspiracy. You know, he's none of those things. He's a super intelligent, like mainstream kind of guy. But I, I hadn't thought about it like he, he talked about it. What that means, though, is that maybe this idea that we are overpopulated, if not wrong, because I'm not willing to concede the argument, is perhaps misguided. And that maybe the way I was asking the question leads to the right answer, which is the way we live now. How can we uh, – and, and he wasn't even talking about – it's funny because it depends on your view of human nature. It, it almost reminds me of the nuclear question that we dealt with in Destroyer of Worlds, which is you had one side where the scientists were saying humankind is going to have to change the way they've always been or we're all going to die. And the other side said humankind's not going to change. Let's be realistic. We're going to have to figure out ways to live with this. And this guy I was talking to was essentially taking the latter viewpoint, which is asking – the great mass of society to make the changes that we're telling them they're going to have to make in a non-authoritarian way is a pipe dream. So you're going to have to do these other things instead. You know, people are going to want their individual transportation vehicles. So you're going to have to make them clean. You're not going to get rid of the, in you know what I'm saying? So his, his whole line of argument was, was akin to the Rand Corporation's idea of nuclear weapons, which I get. I'm rather pessimistic about humankind's ability in a, in a mass sort of way to, uh, to change. Individuals change all the time. Do we, do we change collectively? And for example, I'm also very aware that many of the things that we're asking humankind to do is unfair by its very nature. For example, and I know you're familiar with these arguments, so I'll just refer to them. How can you say that the countries that have benefited so much from hundreds of years of industrialization now get to shut the spigot off and tell all the countries that haven't been able to, to do that and benefit from it that they don't get to? To them, it looks like a locking in of unequal situations permanently. And yet, if you say, well, you're right, it's unfair, so let the people in Africa you know, grow into their own version of the United States and, and reach our pollution levels. So I guess – and, and this is funny because it's a wonderful bow tie maybe to wrap our whole conversation in. These situations are so much more complicated – than our knee jerk. And, and to be honest, that the media does a terrible job of explaining scientific stories. It's so much more complicated that I'm not particularly comfortable with average Joes and Janes who, who only want to follow the, the subject long enough to figure it out so that they can have two cents on it. I'm not sure I'm that comfortable with them having it. And yet at the same time, I, I'm suspicious that the 97% of scientists who say climate change is happening would be open to the rogue heretic if, if the data showed otherwise. That That's always what I'm trying to avoid, is that once you get into a frame where we get into historical ruts, it's very difficult to get out of those historical ruts. The amount of data that it takes to change, for example, let, let, let's have a, we've been playing with scenarios, and I won't keep you any longer, because, you know, who ended up keeping who on this phone call, right? <laughs> but Matt, I always like to turn it around. This is how I, this is how I exit. These are the thought experiments I play with. So if you imagine that 100 years from now, so somebody proves that it's not global warming the way we think about. It. And this whole scientific consensus like the Titanic has to change. Can it? How long would it take? Are they going to be so resistant to that idea that they're going to stamp out that reality because it conflicts with a bazillion research papers and the reputations of, of a bazillion science? You know what I'm saying? In other words, whenever um, the forces of uh, inertia begin to pile up, I think it's it's generally wise to be suspicious that the inertia prevents new ways of thinking or new theories or new data from breaking out. But we still have to figure out how to walk the tightrope between being leery of that and not listening to 97% of scientists who say climate change is happening. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, the only way we seem to be able to handle it is to side with one side or the other. 
And the era, you know, I play in this gray area where nuance lives. And this was always a really dangerous place. This is what got me into so much trouble in talk radio because talk radio programmers hate nuance. And that was my business. But to me, this is the nuance. And, and so when we get back once again to continue wrapping the bow to, to my questions about the electorate, how nuanced can we be? How much can we understand and deal with it and apply it? Uh, and, and I'm even thinking along farther lines. If we decide this is important, how can we change the educational system to foster this, right? Are, are there ways to better train ourselves? That's why I'm not doing a common sense show, though. I don't have these answers, but I'm really trying to figure out not only the, the good questions to ask, but the dom dominoes tumbling from those questions and what that would mean. Uh, and I appreciate you allowing me to work a little bit out of, of that out with you right now. <laughs> <laughs>